So data representation is the first unit in higher, and it's basically all about how computer systems store everything, and everything stored in binary. And there's loads of things you need to know about it. You need to know how to use binary, why computers use binary, about signed bit representation, about how we represent uh, negative numbers, how we represent real numbers, how we represent images, how we represent text, something, some things about graphics packages and about compression as well. So the first thing that we cover is why computers use the binary numbering system. And the reason's quite straightforward. Computers, we know, are two state machines. They only work in two states, on and off. And we should hopefully realise that because binary only uses digits 0 and 1, it's also a two state numbering system. So we can use the 1 to represent the on state and 0 to represent the off state. So they can go hand in hand. There's also a lot of advantages for using binary compared to using decimal. First of all, the rules of addition, multiplication, division, there's less of them because you only have to deal with 0 and 1, whereas if we're in decimal we'd have 0 all the way to 9, so there'd be 100 addition rules as opposed to the 4 that are in binary. Data is not affected by voltage degradation over time. Now if you had different levels, if you think of time over time, a piece of data being stored by an electrical signal, an electrical charge, that electrical charge is going to drain over time, so the value that it would store if it was decimal would change over time, but if it's just 0 and 1, even if there's still a slight charge, then it will still recognise that number as a 1. Another advantage is that it's easy to store the two states on back in storage, as opposed to trying to store the 10 different states if we were using the decimal numbering system. Now there is the disadvantages, luckily we don't have to program in it very often anymore, we use a lot of high level languages, but it's very difficult to look at binary and spot mistakes right away, because it's so long to write out the numbers, it also takes up a lot of space to store the numbers compared to if it was the decimal numbering system, so it's not all positive. So what about binary then? You should remember this hopefully. It only uses ones and zeros to represent decimal numbers. We call one binary digit a bit, that's what it's short for, is the smallest unit of memory in a computer. And there's a wee bit of mathematics you need to work out here. With one bit we can only store two different numbers because it's been stored as zero or one. With two bits there's four different combinations that you can see here, hopefully, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So that's four numbers. With three bits, you can see that it doubles again, and we can represent eight numbers, and so on. That's because it's in base 2. If you think back to what you know about maths, and working in tens, it would go in units, tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on, and it goes up by a ratio of ten. Ours doubles because we're in a base 2, there's only two different states as opposed to 10. So, should have a wee think here, this will help you later on when you're thinking about the number of colours that can be used. How many different numbers can you represent with 4 bits, 5 bits, 6 bits, 8 bits and so on. And the easy way to work out is just do 2 to the power of the number of bits you're working with. Now that's going to come back to help in a lot of the calculations that you'll need to do in this data representation, representation topic because it will allow you to work out how many different colours that, for instance, 16-bit colour can store, and true colour, and it will also come back in the computer systems unit when we look at the data bus width and the total addressable memory. So, let's just see how we work out what an 8-bit number is, and we're going to look at the lowest and the highest numbers we can represent. Hopefully you can see the patterns, so starting from the right-hand side, I always write down 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. And hopefully in your calculator, if you have to go up to a bigger number, you would know to just keep doubling it. So the lowest number we could represent is 0, and that would be where they're all 0. And that gives us 0 in decimal. The highest number you can represent is where they're all a 1. And it has to be an odd number because the last digits are 1. You can see these are all even. And to work out what the number is, you simply just add up all the numbers that are a 1 there, so 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 gives us 255. 
but there's 256 individual combinations we can make, which is also important. And the reason there's 256 is because we need to remember we start at 0. So 0 to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4, to 5, you count all the way up, there's 256 different numbers that you can represent. So another way to look at it is how would we represent the number 83 in binary. So again, this red band here, just write that down at the top of your page. Don't do any silly things and write it back to the front or anything, you get completely different numbers. If we're trying to fit 83 into these different numbers, so how I like to think of it is, is building up a wall with these different sized bricks, and 83 is the size of the hole in the wall you need to fill. So if you try and fit 128 in there, it won't fit, so you put a 0. You put a 1 into 64, because that will fit into the gap of 83, but it also means that you've filled a piece of your wall, so it leaves you with 19 left to fill. So we put a 0 at the 32, because that's too big. The 16 will fit in, our gap that we have left, leaving us with a gap of 3. So the 8 would be too big, the 4 would be too big. The 2 would fit, so that would leave us with a gap of 1. So that means we need to have a 1 at the 1 position to add that in. And if you add this up, 64 plus 16 would be 80, plus 2 would be 82, plus 1 would be 83. And it works the exact same way that we looked in reverse. So what you should do is have a wee practice at these. So look at these numbers here, convert these from the binary numbers to decimal, and vice versa, work out what the binary representation would be of these numbers. A trickier challenge would be to try these 12-bit numbers now. Remember the pattern that doubles all the way along the top? <coughs> and there are the answers to those ones. Hopefully you paused it there before seeing the answers. If you wanted a challenge, you could try working out how to represent things in trinary and blow your mind now that you don't have to do this for the higher course. It was just for a carry-on. So, binary is great, it lets us store positive numbers, but we've also got a lot of other things we need to represent. We need to represent negative numbers and real numbers. So we're going to look at two's complement, floating point representation, and signed bit notation as well. So the first way that they invented to store negative numbers is signed bit notation. Now you see here, these numbers are almost the same, except for this 1 and this 0 at the very front of the number. Now the 1 at the front and sign bit tells us that it's a negative number. So what this number actually here is, is 1, 2, 4 is negative 6, whereas this one here is 1, 2, 4, positive 6, just because the 1 at the front. Now the sign bit notation is a wee bit rubbish because after you work out whether it's positive or negative, you've got to ignore that front number. And there's a couple of disadvantages of sign bit notation that you could have a think about now. The first is, what happens when you take that number off? What happens to the range? Well, your 8-bit number you're using to store uh, a negative number only has the range of a 7-bit number because you are getting rid of that leading 1. Also think about what number would it be if it was 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, well, there would be two representations for 0. You would have a positive 0 and a negative 0, and also the math to do addition and things is very complex. So, let's just to cover that again. Sign bit notation has two representations for 0, the positive and negative 0, as you can see there, and you lose the range, because an 8-bit number actually only has the range of a 7-bit number. Two's complement is what gets around how we represent negative numbers. So instead of looking at the first bit and throwing it away, two's complement, which I've spelled incorrectly here, uh, allows you to use all of the bits to represent a number. So for instance, this wee example here is quite messy. It's trying to store a negative 10. So what you do is, first of all, you find what 10 is in binary, so hopefully you can see that that is 1 plus, oh sorry, the 2 plus the 8, because 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, gives us positive 10. Next, we invert all of the bits in the number, and you can see there that the zeros become 1s, the 1s become zeros. And next, we add 1 on. Now, we don't can't go as high as a 2, 
So if you think if you did 9 plus 1 in uh, decimal, you would have 1, 0, which gives you an extra digit. We carry over anything that spills over the number 9. So here when you add 1 plus 1, it gives us 2, and the 1 carries over there, and you can see 1 plus 0 is 1, it doesn't spill over, which means we're adding 0 onto the rest of it, and it doesn't change. How do we work out if it's a negative number? Well, we'll see that when we look on the next part. So, to check, you've got to be careful and see what number representation you're being asked to use, because the numbers are all different. A positive binary number uh, could easily be a negative number in sign bit and a negative number in two's complementation. So, you should try for practice to represent these numbers using two's complement. So, pause it here. So here's negative 9, so I've written down positive 9, I've inverted all the bits, and then added 1 on, so that was quite simple. Negative 45, hopefully these are correct, we've worked out positive 45, we've inverted all the bits and added 1 on. You need to be careful if it carries over, so this one here you can see there's more carryover. We've worked out positive 100, we've inverted all the bits and added 1 on, you can see 1 plus 1 gives a 0 and the 1 carried over, 1 plus 1 gives a 0 and the 1 carries over, 1 plus 0 gives us 1 and it stops there and the rest of it stays the same. And negative 170, the same idea again, invert all the bits after working at the positive value and then adding 1 on again. These ones, you should do the opposite for two's complement, so we're trying to work out what number these are in decimal. Now, be careful, there's a zero here and ones at the beginning. We don't ignore them after we've worked out what they are, but say the same way signed bit, if it's a zero at the front, that tells us it's a positive number. These three here are negative. Now, when it's a positive number, you just work it out the exact same way as you always do, the way we learned in binary at the beginning. But if there's a one at the front, we invert all the digits and add one and then work out what the binary number we have is. Right, so what's good about signed bit notation? So we use signed bit to represent a negative number. We now get the full range of all the number of bits we have. The computer arithmetic is a lot easier because it's inverting and adding one compared to the um, signed bit notation. So there's a lot of reasons why two's complement is a lot better. Next, so we've looked at negative numbers. And we've looked at whole numbers. Now we're going to talk about fractions, real numbers. So if you look at this terrible example here, 23.75, you could write it loads of different ways. Hopefully your maths is great. And if you think when you do something times 10, it moves the decimal place two places to the right. So it would give you 23.75, the same idea. Now this isn't quite how it works out. What we need to think of is a floating point representation uses two things to store um, a number. So the first part is the mantissa, which tells you the actual number. So you can see here I've got 2375, but we're just missing a decimal point to make that 23.75, which is where the exponent comes in, which tells you how many places to float the decimal point from the left-hand side of the number. So if you look here, if we pretend there's a decimal place and moved it once, and twice, that would give us a 23.75, which is what you need to know about how the real numbers are stored. You can have a look at this example now, it will not come up, but it's worthwhile to spend a wee bit of time looking at how you actually represent um, real numbers, so that you can work out the effects that the mantissa and the exponent have on the numbers. Just kind of a bash at trying that as well. The easy way to remember what the effects the numbers have on is remember that floating point is a complete nightmare once you start using it. So M A R E nightmare. Mantissa, the mantissa part of the number, affects the accuracy of the number. So if you to give us more bits to represent the mantissa, then we could represent a more accurate number. And the same idea again, if you had to increase the number of bits that the exponent is stored by, then you can increase the range of the number that we can actually store. So just covering that there. La second last piece, having a look at how text is represented in a computer system. 
So a byte, hopefully you remember, is a space which is used to store one character and a byte is technically 8 bits, so 8 bits and a byte. All the characters that we're going to talk about in ASCII are co that can be represented is known as the character set and every character in this character set has a different binary value, a different code, they're all unique. And ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange and it's one that's adopted globally. But there are obviously other ones because it only lets us represent English letters. So, some facts about ASCII. It's actually a 7-bit code which allows 128 characters. However, it's extended to 8 bits to allow us to represent more characters. Some of the characters don't actually display. They don't do something. They'll have some function. And these are called the control characters, and there's 32 of them, from 0 to 31 in ASCII code are the control characters, and there's several, return, tab, clear screen, and a few others that you could look up and see what they do. We research task, if you want to carry it out, to find out about Unicode, before we tell you. This here is actually the first 7 bits in binary in ASCII, sorry, and you can see that 0 all the way up to 31 are in fact actually things like end of text, end in the line, escape and so on, before we get up to 32 which is space, uh, apostrophes, uh, division signs and symbols, numbers, capital letters, lowercase letters and so on. So Unicode and ASCII code are both representations uh, to display and represent text. Unicode's 16-bit characters. So what are the advantages of that over ASCII? What are the disadvantages? Well, ASCII uses less memory, so it would take up less space in the computer system to store uh, one individual character. However, it's not great because it doesn't let us represent all of the languages in the world. Do you think of Chinese, for example? There'll be lots of symbols, Japanese, the Russian alphabet has different uh, characters in it than we use, different symbols compared to the English alphabet. So the uh, Unicode would allow us with the 16 bits to represent a lot more languages across the globe. And it's really easy to convert between the two of them because the first 128 and the first 256 in fact in Unicode are actually the exact same as in ASCII so it's very easy to convert between the two skip this. This is just a reminder from standard good stuff. A bit is a 1 or 0 and 8 wee bits gives us one big byte. So a reminder for how we remember the order that the memory sizes are grouped in before we do calculations. You get big boys kicked my granny twice to helpfully remind us that it goes bit, byte, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte. We group 8 bits in a byte and 1024 of the others give us the next level up. So there's a reminder of that. This is a calculation you can work out that's a complete lie on how broadband companies mislead us about what our broadband speeds are. But you can see there that you wouldn't go about saying that you've got 33 million bits per second or you don't talk about how many bits that your memory system is. Uh, in your computer system rather. We would talk about having 80 gigabytes rather than that crazy big number there that you probably couldn't quote to anyone anyway. It makes it easy to compare numbers and computer systems. So that there is how you would work out between them. Bits divided by 8 would give us bytes. Bytes divided by 1024 gives us kilobytes and so on. The other way around, bytes times by 8 give us bits. Kilobytes times 1024 give us bytes. Next and last wee piece, we're going to have a look at vector and bitmap graphics, how they both store the images, the difference between them, what is compression, why we use compression, and the difference between lossy and lossless graphics uh, compression techniques. So, the first one that we're looking at is this bitmap image. So that is where we store the colour of every individual pixel. You can see here this terrible drawing uses 49 bits. And the question is why. It's easy to work out. You can either count all of the bits, which would be really difficult to do in the exam because the images they're talking about are much, much bigger and they won't draw every pixel. But it's 7 by 7, kind of looks like a crossword. 7 times 7 
is 49 pixels and hopefully we can remember from standard grade that every pixel requires one bit. Now we're going to see what's different this year because we're going to represent or work out how we represent colour in these graphics. So bitmap graphics, they store the image as a list of the colour of every pixel if you think of drawn in paint. When you draw something on top of another thing, it doesn't store what's underneath it, it just remembers the colour that that pixel was. It's not great because it has a fixed resolution, so when you print it on the printer, it will just look as good as it's drawn on the computer. If you have a really expensive printer, it won't print out at a greater resolution. Even if you scale it up, it will start to look quite pixelated, which as you can tell when something's bitmap, when you scale it up, it doesn't display clearly and accurately. However, it's quite good for editing because you can zoom in and edit the individual colours of the pixels. And a bad a drawback to it is that even if parts of your screen are blank, if they're just white, it just saves the full screen. So it's quite wasteful for memory. Vector graphics are a bit different. It stores images as a list of objects and the attributes of these objects. For instance, it will store the shape, the colour, the fill colour, the line thickness, the X and Y coordinates of it on the uh, screen. It's also resolution independent, which means that the printer, if the printer's got a higher resolution than you've created the image at, then it'll print at the full resolution available in the printer, and it won't look terrible like you, it would if you printed out a bitmap image, because it can scale up and it'll display clearly as, as it was created. You can edit out all the individual objects, which means you can have layering, but you can't edit individual pixels. So here is a calculation you should try and work out. Measuring or working out sorry the image requirements and back in storage of certain images. You can see here we've got a two by two inch image. It's got a resolution of eighty dots per inch and it uses two hundred and fifty six colours, which is the new piece for us. So similarly but before we work out how many pixels there are, so there's twenty five thousand six hundred pixels. And each pixel could be one of 256 different colours. And 256 colours would require 8 bits. If you think back to earlier, if we do 2 to the power 8, that would give us 256. So the bit depth, the colour depth, is 8 bits. So we take how many pixels there are, times by 8, and work it out using the maths we know to work out bits to bytes to kilobytes and so on, to see that this image requires 25 kilobytes. Next, you should try and do this one. So it's 3 inches by 2 inches, it's got a resolution of 150 dots per inch, and it uses true colour, which you need to remember uses 24 bits per pixel, which is about 16,700,000 colours, roughly. And you can work it out how many exactly it is by doing 2 to the power 24. And you should hopefully have worked out that that uses 395.5 kilobytes. And again, similar one here, 4 by 3 inches this time, 350 dots per inch and it uses 16,384 colours. So you need to do a 2 to the power something that gives us 16,384. Uh, 16, now you should have worked out that was 2.45 megabytes. And hopefully you can do some math to see where that answer is coming from. Last wee piece now, compression techniques. There's two types of compression. Compression just purely reduces the size of a file to save space in a computer system and there's different types lossy and lossless compression lossless compression means that you don't lose any quality of the original image and there's several different ways that we can compress images like they would count the number of repeating pixels that are the same color and store that rather than storing the color of every pixel is so this is one way of keeping the quality of your images very high and reducing the amount of space that it requires to save them. Lossy compression is a bit different. This is where it will sacrifice data to reduce the file size and it's quite a math complex mathematical process. It will be able to reduce the file size a lot more than lossless compression but it will sacrifice some of the things our eyes can't see and sometimes it will be quite a visible effect it will have on it. Advantages of compression, well, it means there's a lot more space and back in storage on cameras and things. You'll be able to store a lot more images if they're compressed. 
it takes less time to transfer, to upload and download these images via email and attach them and so on. Disadvantages of compression, well, if you keep and continually compressing images, you're going to ruin the quality of them. It will take a long time to compress very large images as well, or even if you're trying to compress video files. And if you look at any compressed images, sometimes they're not always great and it, you'll start to see things appear in the image that aren't actually there before. Last wee bit that you should come back and look at in Topic 5 anyway is looking at JPEGs, TIFFs and GIFs. Now JPEG is a lossy compression technique, uh, it uses true colour and the way I remember it is I think of putting pegs in my mum's washing line and forever pinging them in, in my neighbour's back garden and remember that pegs are lossy. Whereas GIF is another image you should look up which is lossless compression but it uses a poorer colour range. And we get TIFF, which is an uncompressed file format, a RAW format, that has different compression levels, but it also allows you to store a transparent colour.